Hello and welcome from Berlin for this webinar on the German Energy Transition 2019 State of Affairs, what happened. So first of all, some technicalities. Uh, we will give the presentation uh, now in a second for around 20 to 25 minutes. And after that, we will have a Q&A session for more or less another 30 minutes. If you experience any technical difficulties, please state that in the chat window that will appear soonly. We will let you know and then we will try to help you. We have a communications team around us that will assist us with this. All information on the study you can find online, the study itself. We have um, different material in English. We have the deck of slides and we have a French summary, for example. You can download all the graphics and use them if you like. Um, so feel free to do that. Also, the presentation of this webinar can be downloaded and you will see it in a second where you can do that. Right down there. So you can download this already right now. Exactly. And this webinar will also be posted on our website and on YouTube afterwards in just a few days time. If you have any questions, please state them in the chat window. We will gather them and sort them and then try to answer all of them. The chat window you can find right here. Yes, uh, perfect, we have it. Um, please state your name and affiliation. That makes things for us a lot easier. So that's it for the technicalities. Let me introduce myself. My name is Fabian Hein and I am an energy analyst here at Agora Energiewende. And I will hand over. Thanks Fabian. Uh, my name is Frank Peter. I'm coordinating the German work within Agora and I'm one of the co-authors of this study. Um, the study itself has become something like an Agora trademark for the last couple of years, um, providing a comprehensive analysis um, of the state of the energy transition as soon as the new year starts and arrives. And we are doing so while we are knowing that uh, sound or profound energy policy analytics is the foundation of any policy work you can um, come up with. You need to know about the state uh, of affairs of the energy transition um, quite soon. It's, uh, it causes always a very high political interest as well and therefore we try to come up every year as early as possible with this um, all-over analysis of the state of affairs of the energy transition. Therefore we have to rely on let's say real-time data and real-time analysis. Um, a real consolidated data from, for example, from the AG Energiebilanzen is available um, almost two years later. So this, is, um, this analysis we are presenting is dealing with pre preliminary data, um, so to say, and this of course has to be considered when judging on different developments. Um, well, so let's get started and uh, jump into the first uh, slide. Um, Fabian, your task. Yes, exactly. So what was very special in 2019 was the rise in public interest. What we can see here and what we can see in this first graph is uh, basically a poll, a survey that has been ongoing for many, many years. We can only see though the last two years, so early January uh, 2018 until December 2019. And what we can see in the pink or purple line is the interest of the public uh, opinion or uh, in general of the public on climate change related topics. So the question that was asked is please state the, fo uh, the top five political problems in Germany and this is the result that you can see. And as of April, May the latest, I would say, you can see that climate change is the top uh, topic number one. So the public opinion has been risen. At the same time, the service also, or different service also showed that around 75% 70 of the German population thinks that we will not be able to combat climate change in an effective manner. 
and on top of that 60% are unhappy with the current climate politic. I hand over to you. Okay, so let's uh, jump into energy consumption 2019. Uh, we have seen a decrease in the primary energy consumption uh, quite considerably over the, uh, compared to 2018. Uh, what helped us was that we have uh, a slow economic growth, uh, especially basic material production industries have um, had a year with low capacity uses uh, in the industry. We had uh, a warm weather during the winter with low heating demand and all those developments together helped really uh, getting down primary energy de uh, demand. Um, what you can see um, on the structure is that still oil and gas are the dominant resources when it comes to primary energy consumption. Um, coal has lost shares compared to uh, 2018, which is, for, of course, for climate reasons, a very good thing uh, to see. But uh, the overall structural change in the primary energy consumption, of course, is uh, too slow to reach our climate targets in the future. We need to speed up this transformation in the energy sector, um, getting down the, the oil and the gas demand and the coal demand is um, the big thing that we need to achieve uh, in order to reach climate and neutrality in the future. Um, on the next slide, you can see the development over the course from 1990 onwards. Um, there you see that uh, renewables sh the renewable share increased uh, over the time slowly, but nevertheless. And uh, what you can really, what we really experienced over the course of the last three years is that coal and lignite both are seeing a major dip. And uh, this is for uh, climate reasons a very good sign that we see. But you can also see the rather stable plot of um, oil consumption that is basically driven by um, the transport sector, which is um, more or less unchanged uh, over the course of the last years. And this is, of course, a big challenge for the German uh, energy transition targets to get this chunk of oil out of the system is um, if a big thing to go forward with in order to reach our climate targets. The gas demand has been increasing over the course since gas more and more started to replace coal um, in the industry, coal in the power sector, and uh, mineral oil products uh, in the heating sector. Gas is somewhat uh, the bridge fuel that we see in the energy transition to maybe even grow a little further in the future. But in the end, also the gas has to become green in order to achieve our climate targets uh, by 2050. Um, when looking at specific products in the, in the oil sector, um, you see um, what the German policy of the diesel privilege uh, has led to. Uh, the increase of diesel demand over the course of the last um, 30 years um, really outpaced um, the, the, the demand uh, decrease in, in for, for gasoline that we have seen. So um, the diesel demand has really been increasing, driven by uh, transport sector. The transportation of goods is basically um, based on road transport, where the trucks use a lot of diesel in, this, uh, in these um, consumptions. Um, we hope to see a plateau for the diesel demand, but um, the challenge or the thing is that diesel in, in this year, uh, after the slight decrease we saw in 2018, have been increasing, has been increasing uh, once again. So um, we hoped to see uh, a change in the trends last year, but th this didn't happen or last uh, until 2019. Uh, what we also have seen in 2019 is a rise uh, for, for heating oil. Once again, the demand for heating oil, um, you have to understand that heating oil always has some storage effects, of course. Um, if prices are high, usually people tend to wait with their uh, with buying new heating oil for the season uh, if prices are low uh, what they have been this year compared to compared to last year people tend to um, yeah build up a, a stock of heating oil and uh, 
and um, therefore that's the reason why we think this year has seen a, a, a heating oil increase in the system. Um, we have to wait for the next year when uh, in 2021 um, in particular we will face in the carbon pricing in Germany on heating oil um, and it could be expected that uh, the heating oil demand in the next year will increase once again because of the effect that we expect a price increase in 2021 um, due to the fact that we will introduce a carbon price even if it's only 25 euro per ton but nevertheless it will lead to price increases people will notice and people will put anything they could uh, in the store uh, to in to really then um, have um, yeah a sufficient amount of oil uh, in the stocks okay um, when it comes to our efficiency targets um, you can see that um, we somehow decoupled uh, the energy consumption from our economic growth we have experienced substantial economic growth since 2010 um, but uh, the primary energy consumption remained rather stable also the power consumption um, but uh, if you compare this to our targets in 2020 we have to be realistic and say still our energy efficiency ambitions are too low as of now we need to increase this in order to finally get down energy consumption much further um, so the decoupling of the, the um, economic growth from uh, the primary energy demand is not yet um, uh, achieved in a way that we need it in order to really reach our um, targets in the future. We need to get here uh, a much more decoupling in the future. If economic growth is going to continue, um, we need to uh, achieve a point where still energy demand uh, has to decrease much more than it has done in the past. Um, we potentially will uh, reach our 2020 um, efficiency target on, on the power consumption, but um, overall that, that's not such a, such a big thing uh, going forward. Much more important is the general decoupling of uh, economic growth and overall energy demand, which is not sufficient yet. Fabian, how, how about the power generation in 2019? Yes, so what we can see here uh, makes us very happy. We have a rising share of renewables in the power sector. Um, when, when it comes to generation, we're at around 40% already. Um, and what we can also see compared to last year, if you look at the percentage values, that the amount of coal decreased substantially. So we have a new record actually with the renewables uh, as we had uh, in the last years. They have provided more than ever before. Uh, this is due especially also because we have an above average year for wind and also for uh, sun. So solar PV in that sense uh, provided a lot of electricity. When it comes to the next slide. There we go. So now we can see the conventional energy carriers in the power sector. And here we can also, we can already see that hard coal decreased substantially. This has already been the case in the last few years, but what is very new or what was very new in the last year, 2019, is that also lignite that has been constant, if you look rather to the left, since the 1990s more or less, and now in 2019, we had a massive decrease also when it comes to lignite. And this is very new. On the other hand, when we look at renewable energies on the next slide, we can see the exact opposite. So since the 1990s, uh, at first it was quite slow, but since the 2000s, we have uh, quite a big increase in renewable energies that is mainly driven by wind and solar since biomass capacities are limited. Uh, we do see that there is quite an amount of biomass also, but in the future we will have uh, to reflect on that, that the capacity for biomass is limited and in the future the main drive will be wind and solar. Exactly. So here's an overview and what we can see here is the big decline in coal generation in total. We had more than minus 
50 terawatt hours, which is, uh, I think, around more than 30% decrease in hard coal and more than 20% in lignite. And at the same time, we can see that renewables went up by almost 20 terawatt hours. Uh, at the same time, we can see that gas went up. This is due to uh, partly coal gas switch that we will explain a little more uh, later on. And we, what we can also see is that our trading balances, our net imports, went down. We are still a net exporting country at around uh, 35 terawatt hours, but the surplus is just a little less than it has been last year. Overall, also the consumption decreased partly due, as uh, Frank already said, due to a mild winter and to a, uh, well, slightly less big, less big growth of uh, the industry. All right, so now let's take a look at the greenhouse gas emissions in 2019. Yeah, so here we can see again, the graphics shows the gr development of the greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 up until 2019. We estimate that in 2019, the greenhouse gas emissions will be at around 811 million tons. We can also see the target for 2020 and 2030. And what, what we saw is that we had a decrease from 2018 to 2019 of around 50 million tons, which is quite substantial. It has seldomly been uh, that much uh, in the last decades. And it looks like, uh, when you look at this graph, that we could eventually reach our climate target for 2020, which would be minus 40% compared to 1990 right now we are at minus 35%. So there's been a lot of questions. Does this mean we will reach our climate targets? And the answer is very likely not so. Um, we will probably not reach this climate target due for a number of reasons. So first of all, uh, last year we had a really good wind and solar year, which doesn't have to be the case in the upcoming years. Next, we have the coal gas, which, with, which is also, uh, number one, it is limited, and number two, uh, this was due to high CO2 emission prices in the EU ETS, and it was also due to low gas prices. But it's not exactly sure that this might be the case in the upcoming years, that the gas price will stay this low, and also that the CO2 price will stay this high. If this changes, obviously, coal goes up again, gas goes down, since coal has uh, higher emission factors, so higher specific emission emissions per kilowatt hour, this also means uh, rising emission. There are a few other factors, for example, that uh, we will have to replace 1.4 gigawatts of nuclear power, uh, which was decommissioned by the end of last year. This was uh, in Philipsburg, and well, this hole somehow has to be filled, and if we can provide this with renewable energies, there will be other sources that, as a tendency, have also emissions. So this is, would be one more factor. Also, what we saw was a decrease uh, in the total power consumption and the total electricity consumption, which is also not necessarily the case for the upcoming years. And those, all of those factors combined basically show, oh, I actually forgot one really important one. Mm, basically, all of the emissions decrease happened in the power sector, whereas in, for example, uh, the traffic sector, we actually will probably see that 2019 showed a slight increase in emissions. So to sum up all of this, we saw the decrease in emissions basically only in the power sector. And in the power sector, there are many factors uh, that indicate that this decrease might not be sustainable. So if the power sector can provide next year and the other sectors probably will not provide that much either, it could actually mean that we will eventually see a slight increase, although this is, uh, this is not exactly sure. But to reach the target, we would need uh, a decrease of 60 million tons compared to 50 million in the last year. And we don't really see that happening, that we actually will step up the game and decrease even more than we did in the last year. Okay, thanks Fabian. So the decrease in emissions um, 
mainly resulted from the power sector. And here is why that happened. So you saw um, over the course of the last years um, this pink line and, and substantial increase in European ETFs um, emission prices, which um, basically led to the point that um, the costs for coal-fired power generation really went up, even though um, that uh, the, the coal prices in the international trading um, resulted to be a bit lower in 2019. Um, but also the gas prices had downward trends. Um, oil had rather a stable development with, um, with not so much price changes on a yearly or an annual basis. Um, this is coming from a just a relaxed supply situation that we have. Um, so there, there's not so much changes on the price levels on the international level going forward. But the really, um, the, the real big development that, that sticks into the eye is really um, the increase of the CO2 prices since 2017. And this has led to substantial changes in the generation costs in the power sector, um, what we see on the next slide. With the increasing prices for CO2, the, the marginal cost of operation of uh, old lignite plants with an efficiency of about 33%, that's at least our assumption here, have really be been increasing. Um, the reason is quite, quite good to understand. Per megawatt hour of uh, electricity generated from lignite, more than one ton of CO2 is emitted by the existing plant. So the factor, uh, one, one euro increase in CO2 price uh, translates in um, one euro increase of costs for power generation from an old lignite asset. And this is really driving up the costs for uh, lignite power generation over the course of the last three years and resulted also in that dip we see um, uh, in the power generation from this source. Um, already in 27 we had at first the case that um, new gas plant generation produced electricity to lower costs compared to hard coal plants. And this um, level of uh, cost advantage for new gas installation has remained uh, in the market. And, and this, of course, has been driving down the, the coal-fired power generation in Germany as well. Um, we have seen record lows for coal-fired power, uh, coal power generation over the course of the last three years. And um, what really new is now that um, Lignite and uh, the, the lignite gap to gas is really closing by the even steeper increased uh, CO2 price. And this is really new. So this leads to the fact that uh, lignite fired power generation, whenever the prices are below 30 euros, and tend to then start to ramp down their generation and really go out of the market, which has been um, happening occasionally over the last year. You can see it in our agorometer quite often that uh, the lignite power generation sinks in and is uh, limited to its minimum generation capacities that is required for technical reasons. And uh, this, of course, has been driving um, the emissions going down in the power sector mainly. Just a really quick word on that. What you basically can see are the marginal costs or the generation costs for different types of plants uh, over the last few years. And there you can see that modern gas plants are now basically breaking even with old lignite plants. Obviously, these, uh, the, these are rough numbers. You can go up and down a little bit. Uh, it depends a little bit. But it is clear that basically hard coal um, already for, for a few years um, has now to fight against gas. And now lignite is there as well. Right. And uh, this is, of course, also the reason why we expect if the prices are in the same range in the future that the trend of um, decreasing coal could go forward. But if prices change substantially, for example, um, limited gas resources or whatever, um, gas price goes up, there's a huge potential that we may see a shift once again in the power sector, that coal might get much more generation uh, in the future and uh, could also lead to the point that increasing emissions are a reasonable estimate for the future or could be a reasonable estimate in the future. 
Okay, um, electricity prices and, and uh, power market flexibility in 2019 are next in our agenda. Let's jump in. What you see here is the future power prices for the years um, traded forward 2020 till 2024. We have just displayed here the years um, that already have shown some liquidity on the market. This means that um, real amounts of electricity that time uh, delivered uh, should be delivered are traded. Um, you could also trade electricity um, already as of today for the year 2025 and 2026, but there are not so much amounts traded, so this is rather not a liquid market, and we have left this out uh, for, for that reason out of this graph. Um, what, you have, what you can see in this graph um, in the development of the year 2019 is that the estimates um, that we will see in the future uh, a shorter market um, have really been um, increasing over the year. Um, the light blue line um, is presenting year 2020 and the, the, pri uh, the price estimates uh, for that year in the market and you see that um, producers and traders see um, the lowest prices um, in 2020 and afterwards uh, the market is expecting higher pri power prices to occur in the German wholesale market um, and there are several reasons for that. Um, we have experienced in this year the, the really um, big limp in the, in the installation of renewables especially onshore wind which of course is um, not, not solved yet. We will see low installation rates potentially also in 2020, 2021 going forward, and this leads um, to lower capacity additions. And uh, as you know, renewables affect uh, the wholesale market price, uh, the so-called merit order effect is decreasing the prices at wholesale power market level. And if one assumes that lower installation will come in, then, uh, of course, um, with the given fact that we will get rid of uh, some nuclear plants till 2022, and we also will lose some coal-fired power installation in the future, um, there's a tendency that the market might be shorter in the future. So higher power prices for that reasons on the wholesale market level are reasonable in our understanding and are, and are clearly showing here that um, we have, uh, let's say, space for additional renewable installations, also from a price perspective. So uh, the market is expecting lower renewable installations and therefore sees higher, higher prices uh, in the upcoming years with the, with the downward um, electricity generation from coal and, and nuclear is um, the, main, um, yeah, the main summary from this slide. And uh, we, we therefore presented it because we already see price effects in the future from a lacking renewable installation and this is what uh, concerns us as well. And of course, um, industry in Germany is looking at this um, uh, development as well because industry is um, a huge part of the, of the consumer who is really trading at the wholesale level and who is very active there. And power price increases are something they do not like for their uh, energy intensive productions there. And um, therefore, they are also fighting for higher renewable build out in Germany because they expect lower prices in the future if there's sufficient uh, renewable energy supplied here. Um, next slide uh, is showing um, the prices uh, in Europe at the wholesale market level um, compared um, between different countries. And what you can easily see is that the markets with the highest renewable shares show the lowest prices across Europe. And uh, the markets that are very coal heavy still, like Poland, see substantial price risk coming from increasing CO2 prices. So um, markets that have a huge share of coal and are not set to have um, replacement capacity, switching capacities, for example, from gas or something else, have to stick to their um, coal-fired power generation, even if CO2 prices and the European trade uh, at the European market I increases. And this, of course, is bearing a big price risk for consumers, uh, for example, in Poland. Um, 
Italy usually has higher power prices at the wholesale market level as well because Italy is heavily um, relying on gas and uh, relying on a gas market that is more expensive than the northwestern market. Therefore, power prices, gas-based power prices in Italy tend to be higher usually than they are in middle Europe. Um, Interesting is that uh, Scandinavia, of course, sees very little wholesale market prices uh, as well. And uh, the reason, therefore, is a, a huge chunk of hydropower that they have available. And, of course, a massive increase in renewables as well. And uh, this is really driving the level of power prices um, in the future much more than we have seen in the past. And uh, this is something we will have in mind uh, or in the eye on the future developments as well. And um, as we see it right now in Poland, for example, people tend to start to understand that renewable sources are also something like a hedging instrument for the risk of increasing uh, CO2 prices in the future. And therefore, in Poland, we see much more activities right now to increase the renewable share. For example, has Poland discussed uh, to increase the offshore wind or to start install offshore wind installation massively in the future? These are all strategies uh, that uh, are reflecting the issue that Poland sees very high power prices. Okay, um, big topic in Germany always are negative prices for electricity. And negative prices occur when um, we have very high shares of renewables in the market and uh, for whatever reason a conventional power is not able to ramp down as much as it would be required for flexibility reasons. Um, it could be uh, an associated uh, heat generation that is uh, the, the reason why a conventional power plant cannot go down. It could provide balancing power in other markets. Um, several reasons are uh, thinkable why um, power, power plants, conventional power plants tend to stay in the market um, even if very high renewable shares are, um, have been seen. And of course, the very high renewable share in 2019 led to an increase in the number of hours where we saw negative prices at the wholesale market level in the day ahead prices. Um, 211, sorry, 211 hours where um, we see have seen negative prices um, in 2019. The average, uh, however, of the of the negative prices remained fairly or nearly constant compared to 2018. So we see low negative prices. Um, of course, the year 2012 sticks out with an average uh, negative prices of 70 euros per megawatt hour negative prices. After that, we had the re some several reforms in the power market. Um, the the market uh, participants. Um, are getting used to it and we see that we have um, room for flexibility, especially also on the demand side with these negative prices. Um, and if you consider that we might see an increase in electromobility in the next years or heat pumps, um, there's of course uh, a, a source of, um, um, of demand side responsibility. The, this, this could also reflect uh, negative prices much more, but what we see at uh, current levels is that uh, the network tariffs and the EG levy itself and the structure of our pricings are not helping us to increase the flexibility here on the demand side. And this is a big request uh, that we see or that we need in the future um, regulation transformation to go forward um, to be able to get this flexibility uh, into the market. We need. Uh, urgently a reform of the of the network tariff structure in Germany and that's what we trying to to get going uh, within the next year um, as as we see that the demand for flexibility in the market will increase so when it comes to renewable auctions that took place in 2019 and also a few words on the EEG levy cost we'll get started right on the next slide with the uh, PV auctions, I believe. Yes, here they are. Uh, what we could see is that we had a price peak uh, early in 2019, and after that we got a little further down again, uh, basically more or less on a level 
as we've been by the end of last year. Um, this makes much sense. We had a lot of bidders um, in all those auctions, so that the price decrease after this first price peak is quite logic. When we look at the joint auctions for PV and onshore wind, uh, we had something very new. So what happened already in the past is that we had a few uh, wind bids uh, that didn't get really any money out of that. So we didn't have any positive bids from onshore wind. And what we could see this year was that we had auctions where there were actually no onshore wind bids whatsoever. Um, this is due for a number of reasons. Number one, they're more expensive than solar PV at the moment. And uh, basically reason number two is that when we look at the wind auctions on the next slide, um, we can see uh, a very different picture. So basically as of sometime in 2018, I believe we basically have a constant value of those positives. So what is shown also in the last slide I should have explained earlier is basically uh, the positive bits, uh, the average price of those positive bits um, that actually yeah, were favored. So now going back to the wind auctions here, we can see that all the average of those positive bits is basically at 6.2 constant. And this was the maximum uh, amount that you could beat in those auctions. Why did that happen? Why, well, basically all those auctions were short on bidders. So if we have uh, 500 megawatts and everybody knows there's only going to be 300 megawatts in this auction, everybody can basically bid the maximum bid and will still receive uh, this amount because there are no competitors. And this is basically what we can see here also relates back to this development of the greenhouse gas emissions because obviously uh, the lack of competitiveness right here, number one, raises costs in general. And number two, this is the amount that will be lacking in the next couple of years uh, in the generation of onshore wind. Because basically we calculate with this full amount of, of the auctions that will be deployed and then we will have the generation. So basically you, can, you could say uh, what we're not installing today will not produce tomorrow. And we will, we're expecting um, a lack of onshore wind generation. This in combination again with uh, the decreased uh, capacity in nuclear reactors and so nuclear generation. Um, when this collides together, it is quite obvious, well, there is going to be uh, a certain hole, a certain lack of uh, electricity to be produced. And if it comes worse to worse, this will be done by coal-fired power plants, which means rather rising emissions. Exactly. And on the next slide we will see, so this is from our uh, EEG levy calculator that we provide on our website, where you basically you can give in a few input parameters and then you can see uh, how the renewables uh, will evolve and also how the costs will evolve. And what we can see here is basically that we are more or less on top of the sill so costs will s very soon go down. This is due because uh, the levy is usually only for 20 years. And 20 years ago, basically, when the first uh, generators got this levy, received this levy, so uh, very early was mainly PV and uh, onshore wind, also a little biomass. And after 20 years now, they will drop out. Since they were the first ones, they got a really high levy. And now that they drop out, it means that we have a tendency of declining costs. And we also show here the share of renewables. And uh, it is very important because we have uh, a target, a climate target, also concerning the share of renewables, which would be 65% in 2030. And don't be misled here. What we can see, the 65% are in 2035. So under current conditions, with uh, the lack of onshore wind being installed, we actually estimate that we, that we will not uh, reach our climate target, but we will rather get to something around 58, 59% everything under the current conditions. All right. When we have a look at the household electricity prices, uh, we estimate that in the next, so in this current year, um, 2020, 
compared to 2019, we will again see a slight increase of around 0.6 or 0.7 cents per kilowatt hour um, due for a number of reasons. Uh, for example, because the EEG levy rose again also for one of the last times most likely. So we expect uh, this increase of 0.6 to 0.7 cents per kilowatt hours in 2020. But then again, 2021 or 2022, the latest, we actually expect uh, rather a decrease in household electricity prices. Um, this is due, number one, because uh, EEG total levy costs, uh, what we had on the slide before, are decreasing. And also, currently, there is an ongoing debate that uh, probably uh, we will have a new law for the non-ETS sectors and some of that money that we collect in that way will actually be used to decrease the EEG level, uh, the EEG levy uh, even more, which means uh, actually as of 2021, we could also see a decrease in EEG levy costs and thus this would also mean um, a decrease in household electricity prices if everything else stays more or less the same. Okay, okay. <coughs> thank you Fabian. So much for the hard facts on the energy transition. Let's have a look at the political developments of 2020. Um, 2020 is, um, is uh, something that we are really looking forward to because um, we, uh, it will be a critical year for um, the climate policy all over the world. Uh, 2020 is the, the Paris plus five year and COP 26 in uh, Glasgow is uh, set to happen by the end of the year. Um, um, it's a, a COP that will take place in Europe with uh, Germany holding the European presidency at that time. Um, it has, of course, to be um, considered when talking about further political actions. And um, what we also see in Europe is the ongoing debate over raising the European ambition level to 50 or 55 percent, which will then, of course, will be placed into the political debate also at the COP26. Um, we need uh, European leadership urgently in that manner to really make more or to, or to in initiate a higher ambition also on the international level. And rising the EU ambition to 50 or 55 percent is essentially needed to drive this progressive um, approach towards the end of the year to have this positive, um, positive climate and to, to go forward into the negotiations. Um, this, from our point of view, is very crucial going forward. What we need uh, in Europe to really reach 50 or to, to raise the ambitions is, of course, also strong German leadership on this topic. And therefore, it is clear that we need to step, our, um, step up our game on energy policy once again on the national level. However, with this current government, there is um, still a lack of ambition, as we see as the, as the current uh, coal compromise implementation is uh, really seeing some bad angles from a climate perspective. If you look at uh, the capacities as they are expected to go out of the market, there is um, a difference between the coal compromise by the coal convention um, we will see not that much emission reductions um, uh, from a budget perspective as we would like to see. We have on the other hand um, the really lacking build out of onshore wind which is really um, uh, an important um, driver of the energy transition that we need to fix. Um, without onshore wind um, the target of 65 percent by 2035 will not be possible. We have um, this ongoing debate on minimum distances um, for onshore wind, which uh, would really harm if implemented. So um, the, the build out of uh, onshore wind even further. So there are a lot of things uh, at the national level that are, well, let's say, let's say it, um, yeah, frankly, that are not so beneficial in the current energy transformation. Um, we expect the drive of uh, the current energy or of the energy policy debate in the future really has to come from the European level and the international level. And uh, we are really looking forward uh, how the European Green Deal will evolve, how this will really put into um, regulation. We expect, uh, therefore, 
um, and another ETS reform in the making in the future. Um, we will see how we how we go further with the climate action regulation, whether we will potentially see um, integration of other sectors in European emission trading. Those are all the political developments at the European level that really could help us also from a national perspective to bring down emissions even further. Um, so 2020 is um, a very important year from a political perspective. However, um, we do not expect too much um, progressive input by the German government. In the best case scenario, Germany is not blocking anything at the European level that is required to uh, increase the international ambition level. Um, that's it for now from the, from the policy side. Um, let's have a short look at, at the summary, what we have really carried out here in this report. Well, of course, the key positive thing is emissions have gone down. Uh, we saw the low in coal power generation um, since 1990. Uh, we saw the first decrease of lignite, which really gives us hope that um, driven more by market factors than current policy, we will see um, um, somehow getting close to the 2020 target um, on the emission side. Renewables, especially onshore wind, is a, the today's big concern of the energy transition. We need um, the onshore wind built out to recover immediately, and therefore we need um, additional policy measures that we have to fix in 2015. And uh, this is what uh, one of our key points to tackle in 2020 is. Um, when it comes to costs, um, we, th we are expecting that um, the max is in sight as of now. And uh, as we see that uh, the renewable costs have been shrinking over the course of the last 10 years dramatically, we are hopeful that the max of the, the EG um, will be seen quite soon and then costs for renewable uh, support uh, in the German debate um, will, uh, will really not be that big of a factor as it has been in the past. And uh, therefore we hope that with the decreasing costs for, re uh, for renewable support, we may end up um, getting more political traction on uh, a faster renewable build out here in Germany. Um, and of course, climate change is a real um, issue in the public opinion. And this is also something on the positive side in 2019. Um, climate change is a, a well-considered topic. Um, it's, it has been entered um, public or a mainstream policy, so to say, and this is something that will help us in the future to implement energy transition policies. And um, um, it is, however, not yet reflected in the country's climate politics, but um, as we are quite sure that this movement, um, Fridays for Future, for example, will last, and uh, the kids are not going away from the streets anymore. And that's the reason why we are quite optimistic that this will at some point at least reflect in the public uh, and of course in the policy making uh, in the future. Um, so that's it for now. Thank you for your attention and we are starting with the questions, right? Absolutely. Thank you also from my side. There are a few questions. Could you make it a little bit bigger eventually? Is that possible? So it will be easier to read. Um, uh, on this note, I will already make some uh, advertis. Uh, our website, obviously, um, we have new newsletters in German, also in English, and uh, recently also in French now. You will also find that on the website. And now we have a few questions. I will reread re the first question to be answered. So we have the first question from uh, Rahul Schwenk. How comes nuclear goes up? And also from Matthias Rilling, can Germany really get out of nuclear in 2022 if it wants to achieve its decarbonization targets by 2030? 
Well, how Raul, thanks for the question. Um, why have uh, nuclear gone up in the past? It was basically due to availability factors. Um, usually, uh, nuclear sees uh, long maintenance periods, and if you are in a year where you have a big maintenance coming all around in several plants, then it co of course this could be the case that nuclear has an intermediate down and goes up in the next year when plants are more available. And yes, we believe we can get out, get out of uh, nuclear in 2020. Um, uh, of course, we need to speed up the renewable bit out once again to reach our climate targets, but that's possible. And given the costs that uh, renewables have, um, we will also have the advantage um, compared to investing heavily in making old nuclear plants safe. So um, this is uh, from both sides, in our opinion, a win-win situation. But um, of course, we need to ramp up renewable build out again. And uh, this is a key objective for energy policy in 2020-2021. All right. So this uh, for the conventional part. Now we have a question on the development of emissions from Thomas Jakobsen. How much of the decrease in CO2 emissions was due to less activity for German heavy industry? The Teamster graph for 2019 did not break down the numbers by sectors. That is uh, absolutely correct. That is for a reason, because it is very difficult to do so, um, since we basically go back to data from AGIP and the primary energy consumption and a few more sources, but it's very hard to determine this exactly. So this is why we only give an overall figure. However, we estimate that in heavy industry, you might have seen a decline of around 8 to 10 million tons, potentially. Um, exactly. Basically coming from um, different angles, lower process emissions, lower demand for electricity in their own plants, uh, and lower production uh, also for high temperature heat for industrial processes. But it's, it's a rather small amount. The big decrease has, of course, come out of the power sector. Absolutely. All right, next up on the development of fossil fuels in 2020. There's a question by Berit Moa who wants to know, do you think that oil providers will use 2020 to get people to invest in more oil with special deals? Very interesting question. Well, I would, I would see that um, we will see um, the demand for oil increasing, as I mentioned before. I don't think uh, that this will lead to additional people investing in new boiler infrastructure or something like that, but I could easily see a demand increase in heating oil for just um, making as much as possible in the in the stores and uh, at the lower prices because this 25 um, euro per ton in CO2 price that is expected to be put on heating oil in 2021 will lead to an increase um, of the heating oil prices by about five cents per liter. So um, that that would be mean something, and um, I guess people will um, look at it and therefore potentially, um, yeah, tank much more oil than they would do otherwise. All right. We also had another question on uh, fuels in 2020, which is by. Dimitrios Paturas, which is your assumption on average operating costs of lignite power plants? Do you consider them in the calculation of the marginal costs? So, yes, uh, we do consider them, obviously. Um, it's basically a few factors that influence those marginal costs. Uh, so we take into consideration the CO2 price, uh, fuel prices, and a few other fixed costs um, that we also have a study on that which appeared a few years ago on the marginal cost of different power plants. Anything to add? Right. Um, but by far the biggest factor for lignite plants is of course the CO2 price. Since um, the fuel price is just around in the range of um, 2 to 3 euro per megawatt hour which is the marginal part of the um, lignite price of overall 6 euro per megawatt hour. Um, they are more or less meaningless in the whole calculation. The big thing for lignite is the price for CO2, obviously. All right. Then we have the next question is on renewable energy prices. 
Hanno Bachler wants to know, did you consider the ever lower prices for renewable energy installations? Now the question is, where did we consider this? If it uh, considers the EEG levy calculator, that would be my guess. Uh, yes, we do consider those. We always have in mind what are the current auctions, what are the current prices, and we also have a few assumptions on how we think those ones will uh, develop in the near and further away future. Yeah. All right. Arno is asking why do those uh, 50 to 50 euro per megawatt hour um, not up on the German household electricity bills? Um, uh, and why have Danish and German households the highest prices per kilowatt on electricity bills? Uh, I start with the last. Uh, of course, is it is about taxation uh, in Denmark and EG surcharge, which is another form of somehow um, induced by the government a price element uh, in the in the energy transformation, um, and uh, those are the main reasons why Danish and German people pay the most on the household bills. Um, and uh, um, and the first question, um, well. What what we see is that um, um, suppliers buy of electricity are not buying um, electricity on a daily basis. They buy it over the course of many many years. So um, you, you might remember the futures electricity price curves, and usually suppliers of uh, final customers, small final customers, private households, are buying structured. So price effects of single years do not um, have so much impact on the retail prices. Therefore, um, it's, it's more, it's, it's of course also a hatching strategy by the, by the companies that they put their, um, put their future demand into fractions and buy um, about, you could, you could have a, a, a thumb rule, about 20% uh, of the expected deliveries um, in 2024 is purchased in 2020, another 20% 20, 20 is uh, purchased in 2021, another 20% is purchased in 2022, and so on, so that you end up um, uh, to 100% of electricity that is delivered to the final customers, and it's um, practically purchased over the course of four years uh, in front of the actual time of delivery. Thank you, Frank. Next question is on the outlook of renewables. Danush Arun from Kefson LC is wondering uh, or is saying another challenge to reach the 65% renewable target by 2030 is the rising anti-wind activism in Germany, which has led to a permitting backlog for onshore wind. Are there any steps being taken to make the permitting process for new onshore wind more smooth? And Hanno Bachler wants to know on that note, soon all solar and wind power plants have to close down. How is this considered in your outlook? All right, so I will start uh, with the first one. Um, there is actually quite a big media attention on this topic on anti-wind criticism. However, a recent study actually by the EV Köln, which would be, I would translate it to Institute of Economic Development in Cologne, uh, showed that 80% of uh, the Germans are basically pro onshore wind and it's actually only 5% that are against onshore wind. This is definitely not reflected in the media attention, um, which, uh, yeah, when you look into the media uh, and you watch the news, it seems like there's a lot and uh, a lot of anti-wind, um, uh, a big anti-wind community and it is true, they are connected and there are some and steps have to be taken. However, uh, yeah, what is usually not being said is that actually the vast majority of Germans are very much pro onshore wind. And there are discussions on how to deal with that um, with the public, with public debates, but also on a political side, there are a few things that are now being considered to be taken into consideration. Right now we also have the discussion, for example, around this uh, rule that uh, the generator, a wind turbine, has to be a thousand meters away from people's homes. This is currently being debated um, very intensively. Uh, this would be an attempt to try to get, uh, obviously, even further um, public opinion pro-wind. 
anything to add? Yeah, but nothing is fixed yet. That's yeah. the main reason. Absolutely. So why we are not so optimistic that wind will recover anytime soon. So we have different things that need to be fixed. Uh, we will come up with a paper potentially over the course of spring to um, add on this. Um, and uh, yes, of course, we consider old wind and solar going out of the market. Our average lifetime of existing plants is 25 years in our calculator. And, and that's basically our assumption on that. And after that, um, those uh, installations are going out also of the share of future renewables. And for onshore wind, this will have the effect that the outgoing onshore wind is much more than what is newly installed. So we will potentially see a drop in onshore wind in the future in Germany, which is quite reasonable if you look at the current build out numbers. Um, James Murray is asking. Uh, we still have uh, one question a little further up uh, by Hanno Bachler. Can you scroll up a little bit again? Who was uh, talking about old solar and wind power plants in our outlook? So also. That's what I said. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. This was going through that. Okay. Good. Then go ahead, James Murray. Uh, James asked, uh, what impact is the phase out of nuclear power plants having on Germany's energy sector? Uh, it is improving the adoption of renewable technologies. Um, I would say on the last point, yes, potentially yes, uh, it could be improving because uh, nuclear plants are not the most flexible ones. Um, so we will get uh, room for flexibility. We have even some uh, nuclear plants that are um, behind our network congestion area. So this will also uh, somehow lead to the point that we get less um, generation in the north from conventional plants that are putting pressure on our congestions. And um, of course, what, what uh, the, the phase out of nuclear would mean is that we have to replace quite a chunk of um, so-called carbon-free generation in the future. And that's what we have to deliver on by building out renewables. All right, uh, so now it is actually 12 o'clock and the webinar was supposed to be one hour. I guess this is a strict note. So we will have to close down now. Uh, there were a number of questions that we could not answer right here. Um, but when you look at the slide, uh, you can see my email address. So feel free to drop me a line and we will answer uh, personally on the remaining questions. Once again, thank you so much for joining in. Thank you for the communication team in the background. And once again, feel free to subscribe, uh, subscribe to our newsletters to always be up to date with publications and events. That's it from our side. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, see you next year, maybe. Exactly. Take care and goodbye. <laughs>